Hi, this is Greg Kilstrom. Welcome to season three of the Agile World, where we discuss customer and employee experience, organizational and workforce transformation, and how business can adapt and continually improve in an Agile age. The Agile World podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full stack technology services, talent services, and real world application. For more information, go to techsystems.com. To read more about the topics discussed in this show, you can go to my website at theagile.world and read my latest articles or get a copy of my latest book, The Agile Workforce, now available on Amazon and other retailers. My name is Greg Kilstrom, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Career Gig and the host of the Agile World podcast. Today, we're going to talk about the importance of being intentional about what you want and asking for it in order to achieve your goals. While we can't see our futures, we can help shape our futures and improve our careers, our companies, and ourselves by asking the right questions and looking for a clear path in the answers. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome Mark Victor Hansen. He's the co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series, which sold over 500 million books. Mark has written and co-written several other books, served as keynote speaker, entrepreneur, and empowered many people over the world to create massive success for themselves. I'm honored to have him here and to talk about his latest book, Ask, The Bridge from Your Dreams to Your Destiny. Mark, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Greg. It's going to be a great joy. And I just want everyone to learn how to ask because I, you know, the subtitle of our book, Ask, The Bridge from Your Dreams to Your Destiny, is I believe, as I think you do, everyone's got a destiny and it can be great if they're awake to it. And so my wife and I wrote this book because it's our destiny to help everybody find their destiny. Wonderful. Well, yeah, let's uh, let's let's start our conversation here by talking a little bit about about your journey. Um, so when you first co-wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul back in 1993, did you ever imagine it would turn into essentially its own enterprise? And, and when did you know that it had that potential to become more than a single book? Well, I've been blessed to be a salesman since I was nine years old. So that's way back. And then Jack and I met and uh, we did it together. It took three years, and then 144 publishers all said, metaphorically speaking, hit the road, Jack. And I said, it's okay if you don't like him, but I'm a nice guy. And uh, <laughs> our, our respective spouses were going, what are you guys, nuts? Nobody's taking the book. You not got, you don't get the message because you had all those pink slips. They, they write in pink, I guess, because they love to say goodbye to you and reject you at book publishers. And it's interesting that every one of those guys that rejected me, I'm now with Seven Houses, uh, reaccepted me later. Um, I really know how to sell a lot of books. I'm thankful to say in multiple series, like One Minute Millionaire and all those series that I did, like Aladdin Factor and Dare to Win and all. Anyhow, so the, the point is that we uh, did it. We um, talked it through. Jack and I would write for two hours and then talk and walk and visualize it to realize uh, what could potentially happen. So we owned the concept. We knew that the audiences loved the stories and, and we just couldn't find a publisher until we finally sold it ourselves at. Uh, our our agent even fired us, Greg. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, right? wow. No, I didn't know that. Uh, and I will not mention his name, but that's cost him at least 15 or $20 million. So um, yeah. too bad for him, but better for us because I was willing to sell it. And Jack and I literally put on uh, backpacks with three ring binders and got turned down a whole lot more at, at ABA, American Bookseller Association, where 60,000 booksellers used to be able to attend before COVID. And it was a great experience. I mean, I was just in heaven. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I was seeing all my favorite authors because I'm a book addict because my parents were illiterate Danish people. And I thought, wow, wouldn't this be cool? And then all of a sudden, you know, Mark Twain's line came to my head. Uh, if I die and go to heaven, heaven will be an endless library. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you, if you've never been to ABA, at least when it was working, it was really exquisitely exciting. Yeah. In, that, in this business. Yep. Nice. So, yeah. So, I mean, you were self-publishing basically before that was uh, that was a trend, right? Is that? Yeah, safe Jeff to say? and I both did. I had written a book called Dare to Win and sold three hundred sixty thousand copies from the platform and a couple other books in the church market, like Miracle of Tithing. And Jack had uh, was a Harvard third in his class guy, so I was amazed that we weren't getting it. But he'd sold, I think, four hundred seventy thousand copies of a book he wrote called uh, 101 Ways to Build Self-Esteem in a Classroom." And, you know, he was in, in the educational market and I've always been in a business market because I, I um, wanted to grow up and become rich and like, you know, win the Horatio Altura Award, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that one in a, in a second here. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in addition to, um, to the Chicken Soup um, brand, 
Um, you've managed to create a brand for yourself and as America's ambassador of possibility. You know, I personally think that personal branding is, is so important. Um, can you talk about how building that distinct brand has helped with your success? Well, everyone ought to, I did a whole set of tapes called Brand to Command, and I think everybody ought to have a brand, but the, there's like 33 things you do, but the three basic things are you got to have identity. Everyone's got to know who you are specifically. In my case, Mark Victor Hansen, right? In John Wayne's case, it was John Wayne, right? <laughs> right. Something like that. Uh, so you got to have identity. Then the way you get identity to work is you got to have video representation or pictorial representation whether it's Lady Di, who everyone knows what she looks like, or, you know, Trump right now, everybody knows what he looks like, or, it, you know, they, so, it, and then, um, so it's, it, it's identity, repetition, and um, what is the third point? Space repetition, where you just go over it and over it and over it endlessly, yeah. and so the people really get it and take ownership of who you do and where your space is in universe for whatever specific product you've got, whether it's a, a drink like Coca-Cola, they just endlessly advertise so everybody knows that. Um, you know, they know what yeah. that is and what that brand stands for and the line extension of that brand. Yeah, and that does seem that does seem very consistent within your um, your body of work. That's 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 great. Well, how do you measure success in, in your career? I mean, and and what are the what are the metrics or methods you use to determine where you should, where you should go next? By the way, I've never been asked that question really before, so I really love the question. Uh, in the book business, obviously, the metrics is how many books you've sold, and we're, you know, right. half a half billion, and my goal is to sell a billion. And with Ask rocking to the top right now, that's uh, something that's more believable because I think it's, uh, I, I think the whole Chicken Soup series and the 312 uh, books that I've written are a foundation for where I want to go because I'm 73, but my goal is to live to be 127 with options for renewal. And I'm in really superlative health. And, uh, you know, if you That's have high quality health, you want a high quantity of health uh, and you want to do some stuff and contribute. So then number two is that my goal would be to uh, I, I've had a billion readers of books that I've got my name on one way or another because we're in so many languages around the world. Not every language, but all the major languages in the world, 54 major languages. So that covers a lot. But there's a lot of languages you I, I just bet only because I opened the pyramids in Guatemala. Canada is a language spoken there in India. I was a student ambassador, and you probably never heard of Hindi. And everyone knows Hindi Urdu, but they don't know Telegrees or Canada. Canada, and and yeah. you start to go, holy smoly! There's a lot of people on this planet, and and we yeah. don't know too many people, by the way. Just a quick aside: when I was in graduate school, getting my doctorate with Bucky Fuller, the deal is we've got bad designs. Nobody is designing for the population we got. We have plenty of land, plenty of. We can take care of the people, but we've got to take care of them in a better, smarter, wiser way than we are. Sorry, I know that was a sidetrack on your question, but you asked what my metrics are. My metric really is how do I make the world work for 100% of humanity, physically and economically, make all 8 billion people successful? And I think fundamentally it's reading is the fundamental freedom of freedom. So we got to get 4 billion people that can't read to read, then we can have enough food, water, and all that stuff for them. That's great. That's great. Well, let's uh, let's talk about your most recent book, um, Ask the Bridge from Your Dreams to Your Destiny. I found it uh, extremely helpful in defining how important it is to do something that I know I struggled with a bit. It, you know, it sounds simple to um, to ask for what you want, but so many people have such a hard time doing it. Um, tell us a little bit about why you wrote the book and and why this was personally a topic you felt important to discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my wife and I have traveled to 80 countries, talked to 7 million people. And what happens is we discover great people, wise people, professional people, nice people, but they don't succeed to their fulfillment, right? You're here to fulfill your pen potential, your destiny. Each and every one of us is to fulfill their potential. I mean, in Genesis 128, it says, you know, if you're made in the image and likeness of God, then my position is you've got two C's. You're here to create and you're here to contribute. So we want to contribute. And we say, well, what is it that is that what is lacking in them? And how do they get over the withholds? And how do they get through the problems? And we said, oh, my goodness, it's so simple. And it was given to us, but no one's figured it out. So well, let's write about it. We've gotten through all our problems. And, and you know, even though I've got what most people call vast success, um, and nowhere compared to where I plan to go. But, it, you know, we're teaching three things. Ask yourself, ask others and ask God. And I can go deep on any of those if you want, Greg. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, let's, um, you know, how, how do, how does one overcome that fear of asking, uh, you know, what, what are some of the typical things that, that get in the way of, of, of what you just mentioned? Okay. So when I went bankrupt in 1974, I learned real quick that if you ask the wrong question, you go the wrong result. Like I, <laughs> at 26, I was a hot shot. I thought, and I built the wall street racket club, botanical gardens, aviaries. Bad news is I was building out of PVC plastic at a time when we had an oil embargo. And, and I, I started asking myself, oh, my God, what if I go bankrupt? And I checked out a book, How to Go Bankrupt by Yourself. Now, it turns out long term, that was my best, worst experience. But short term, uh, for six months, I was in Hicksville, Long Island, New York, sleeping in front of another guy's room and um, feeling distraught, disconsolate, depressed, wanting to kill myself because I thought my self-worth and net worth were the same. I thought I'd already cut the mustard. Mm-hmm. And what I realized is, what do I really want to do? Right. Ask yourself. And I said, I want to talk to people that care about things that matter, that would make a life changing difference. Ask others. I went to my three roommates. I was living in Hicksville, Long Island, New York, not doing very well. But I said to the guys at breakfast, I said, any of you guys know somebody young that's speaking, not a lawyer, not a doctor, not a broad because we were in New York, Broadway celebrity or a TV or movie star that's making money. And one of my roommates is in real estate. And he said, yeah, yeah. Here's my ticket. This kid is phenomenal. He's a few years older than you, but he's out in Hop Hog talking today. It'll be a big audience, but you got my ticket. I mean, that was a miracle. I mean, God's yeah, been forcing me. So I go out and hear this guy, Chip Collins, who we became mastermind partners and best friends. But I go watch him mesmerize the audience for three hours. At the end of which I go up and I say, I introduce myself and I, I say, can I ask you to lunch? Because I want to do what you do. He said, look, kid, chance of you doing this is one in a thousand. You ain't going to make it. So just go do something else. I said, no, no, no. Let me just ask the questions and just give me a shot. He said, okay, but you stay out of real estate. I own the five boroughs here of New York. You do life insurance, okay? I said, okay, I don't care. I'll talk to anyone. I didn't know anything about life insurance anymore or anything else. So, But I did a 1,000 talks a year the first three years, and people kept coming up and saying, do you have that story in a book? So all of a sudden I said, oh, boy, I'm keeping getting the same thing. So the first book I did was Stand Up, Speak Out, and Win, into little audiences, insurance audiences and little agencies, six people up to 50 people. I was doing four talks a day. Tony Robbins and I were one time chatting and we're the only two guys that did a thousand talks a year the first three years, you know, and you get pretty good if you keep doing something long enough. Yeah. Right. So I sold the book from a platform and I said, this isn't a New York Times bestseller. It's not even a national bestseller, but it's my bestseller. And if you'd let me, I'd love you to invest in one and I want to sign it to you, your wife, your kids, and your dog if you got one. And I sold twenty thousand copies from wow. the <laughs> and I, you know, it's self-published, and I and I made twenty, yeah, sorry, two hundred thousand dollars. You know, in nineteen seventy-four, that's like two million dollars. I mean, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Yeah, so, you know, I had a, I went from bankruptcy to back up again and never looked back. And the only thing I wish I'd done is write even more books earlier. But other than that, that's it. Yeah. Wow. So when you're, um, when someone understands that they do need to ask and, you know, in, in the three ways that you describe, what's your advice to like, what's your advice to, for them to know even what they should be asking? So, you know, to take it a level deeper, it's like, okay, you're, you're okay. You're comfortable with asking. Um, but you know, what, where do you start with, with that process as far as what to ask? Well, okay, so let me go to the deep part. Well, I'm going to go ask God. So here's what I teach, and I'll give you my example. After I do the macro, I'll do the micro. So the big picture is, the macro, is before you go to sleep, if you don't know your destiny, and 99% of the people that we talk to say, what do you want? Well, I don't don't know. I've got a job. I'm an engineer. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a newscaster. I'm a podcaster. Not very good. That's not the answer I want to get from you. So what you do at night is you go to bed. I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just saying, Hey, wait a second. You've got something here that you're uniquely talented to do with infinite potential. And so what you got to do before you go to sleep at night is 400 times before you go to sleep, push back sleep and say, God, what's your destiny for me? God, what's your destiny for me? God, what's your destiny for me? And in the middle of the night, you'll wake up and you got to tell your sweetie kids, hey, I just heard Mark and he may be a whack job, but uh, he said, I got to have a pen and paper next to bed. Got to turn on the lights. The answer will come because your deeper, innermost, highermost subconscious mind goes out into, you know, infinite intelligence and bring back the answer. You know you're coded at DNA, I believe, to do something great. And most of us miss it because we don't do that question. So let me do it at a very now micro level, uh, 
when I was coming out of my bankruptcy, I wanted to say that 1974, making a hundred grand a year is like being a millionaire, right? It was big, big right. money. Right. And that's only $400 a day, 250 work days. That's a hundred grand a year. So I'd, I'd read that all you got to do is go, oh, I'm going to earn 400 tomorrow, 400 tomorrow, 400 tomorrow. Now, I remember, I'm knocking on doors, cold calling. Nobody knows who Mark Victor Hansen is. I'm only doing life insurance meetings. And predominantly, I was doing Metropolitan and Prudential and Guardian, the three biggest companies at the time. State Farm wasn't in my market yet. But um, yeah. the point is, at 2.58 in the morning, Greg, you can't believe it. My little digital clock read, and I woke up, and I was 100% awake. It was like I was taking Benzedrine or something. And it said, uh, it said state mutual. And I thought, I never heard of state mutual, but I, I know the law. The law is write it down. Write a thing and make it clear it'll be established on you. So I got that law. And then it said Bill Widener. And I go, hell, I don't know anyone named Bill Widener, but I'll write it down, Bill Widener. And I next morning... I had put it in my pocket. I'm out. I do a seminar at, at seven o'clock in the morning. I'm out cold calling until my next uh, seminar is two in the afternoon that day. And uh, I go in this building that's a met, metropolitan building, again, in Hop Hog, Long Island, New York, fortuitously, for whatever reason. And it says Bill Widener State Mutual. And I went, oh my goodness, this stuff really works. Wow. <laughs> I go in and there's nobody at the front desk. So I go straight to what is called a general agent's office, right? Now he thought I was coming to get a, a deal to sell insurance but instead i sold him i asked him the four questions chip collins had taught me he said you were so happy so excited i was so excited to write you a check for 400 dollars. i didn't even care if you came back you just made a whole day <laughs> he and i became great friends i ended up doing all the talks for state mutual even in you know spain and stuff like that so it was it was a it was i mean it was divine but you'd say there's no way i could know State Mutual existed as an insurance company because they're relative. You've never heard of them, I'll bet. And I'm right, not, right. I'm, I'm not besmirching a company. Please don't misunderstand. I like them. They were, they were phenomenal to me. And I didn't know Bill Widener from a bottle of Vic. So there's no way I could know that in my conscious mind. That's why you got to understand. Ask yourself. Ask others. But every one of us, before we go to sleep, got to program our deeper, innermost, tiremost subconscious mind with visualization. I got another book coming out called Visualizing is Realizing to visualize what you want. And I wanted to earn $400 a day. And then the richest salesman in the world, Bill, uh, sorry, um, Ben Feldman at, at New York Life was just amazing. He said, look, is the difference between 400 a day like you're doing, Mark, and 4,000 and, and a million a year, 100,000 and a million is one zero. I said, Ben, I don't get it. What do you mean? He said, 400 a day, he had one zero, it's 4,000. And if your kid's life depended on it, and you got five kids, could you earn 4000 a day? I said, of course. Yeah. And he said, well, then just go do it 250 times. you got a million a year. And he got me to start making a million a year. And, and people listening out there go, oh, that's easy. You're Mark Victor Hansen. You can do anything. No, no, I can't do anything. I, all of us are the same. We're all over-endowed with 18 billion brain cells. But consciousness has got to program subconscious. Go out to Some people call it super conscious. God, I don't care what you call it. But I care that you use the technology, and that's what we're teaching in our book, Ask, this profound technology that is a, so available. It, 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 here's the big spiritual line. It's parted from us by the flimsiest of screens and just requires the requisite stimulus so the universe conspires to give you what you ask for. Isn't that poetic? Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful well yeah no definitely definitely recommend um everybody listening picks up a copy um and so to to switch topics a little bit here um you also spend a good amount of time working with young people uh, to help them become financially literate and consider entrepreneurship um in addition uh, you and i share a connection uh, my wife works for the horatio alger association um, which provides college scholarships to deserving students, of which you're also a member. Um, why is it uh, why is it so important to dedicate time towards these efforts? Um, and and you know, young entrepreneurs, young potential college students. Why do you feel that's so important? Well, first of all, the Horatio Alger Society is those of us that have won against the odds, and it says each of us have gone from rags to riches and been excessively philanthropic. And, and all of us have agreed to uh, help out college kids because my old minister in New York, Norman Vincent Peel, is the guy who started this thing, you know, now 70 years ago and is an amazing, 
I mean, he would just, I love Dr. Peel and Mrs. Ruth Peel. Um, and, and anyhow, so we've helped these kids and I can just, the stories from the kids will just rip your heart out. And we help at-risk kids get to go to college. I think the number, and your wife may have given us a different number and you can change the number if I'm wrong, but I think it's 25,000 kids we've either had to go through college or gotten college. We've got a quarter billion dollars in the funding now, but one of the, I got, uh, can I quickly do two kid mentees? And I've really oh, sure, sure. Yeah. the richest kids in America, but one of my mentees comes out of Vietnam when his father was working for us as a Colonel in Vietnam and gets to go to a prisoner war camp. And his mother's got six kids, doesn't know if he's ever going to come back, but feels that he's still alive. So she won't date and she won't marry. And she does little businesses and feeds her kids one egg a day and just goes through tortures of the damn the, Father finally comes back after six years. They're both people that get over to Hong Kong and then finally get to America. And this kid is so super bright. His name is Nathan Wynn, you know, and he won the scholarship because, you know, he's just uber bright. And yeah. he said, you know, Mark, I uh, want you to be my mentor. And, and every one of us mentee has these kids as our mentees. Anyhow, I helped him make $5 million the first year in a company called, um, instrumental savings and the kid is just doing marvels and he's just one the other one i want to tell you about is that as you know where when before covid we'd always be in washington dc and most of us got to go to the white house and then we'd yeah. uh, meet the state department and we ate dinner at the at the uh, you know library of congress and it, it's really an exquisite event for several days uh, and you can go to the horatio algeria association website and watch videos of all of us whether it's tom Selleck you like or you know, we, 10 of us from the curriculator get in, enrolled a year and then one international and they're all extraordinary human beings and we all get along and we all help each other. But most of all, we help the kids. Well, this time I'm in the state department and uh, this tall six foot plus kid, I think he's six foot eight, comes up to me and says, my name's Tim. And, and uh, I was really abused as a kid, but I, I'm told that you own a solar energy company, natural power concepts. I said, guilty. He said, uh, I've created a way to make solar panels um, about 400% more effective. Are you interested? And I go, oh boy, I'm in the windmill business. We do uh, pop-up windmills at Natural Power Concepts and we do pulsating waves. We do devices and everybody ought to go look at our videos because they're really cool. But I said, Tim, yeah. you're going to Stanford as a, here's what, and my wife's sitting there with me and I said, here's what we want you to do. First of all, when you go to Stanford, do not sign off anything to Stanford. No university deserves mm -hmm. your genius. You own the patent on it. And if you need money, I'll lend you the money. So you patent it in your name, under your ID, under your brand. Don't give that to the university because every university is omniscient now. And, and I'm yeah. faculty yeah. on several. And I think it's immoral what they're doing to these kids that come up with these brilliant ideas that work. I mean, this kid showed me his little blueprint sitting at lunch. And I went, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. It's going to change the world because yeah, well. E equals MC squared is true, whether you like it or not. E is all the energy of the universe. And it's either matter or it's radiance. And if it's radiance, let's turn it back into energy and, and matter. And this kid had a way to, to multiply that. And that's, that's why we're in the most exciting time in history. Politics aside, technology is going to give us fundamental abundance for the first time to, like I said earlier, take care of 8 billion people. That has never existed in history, never existed 8 billion people, never existed the technology awareness. And now that's why you got to have self-awareness to get to technology awareness, to get to fundamental awareness so we can make the planet work. Pretty esoteric what I just said, but it's a lot of words, but I think- I it's love cool. it, yeah. Did it make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I'm totally on board with that. <laughs> okay, good. Well, it's a, you know, some people go, what are you talking about, boy? And I go, well, the big guy said, John 10, 10, you might have life in that more abundantly, but, and he could turn water into wine, but I can't do that. But I, well, I guess I could by growing grapes, but it'd be a real <laughs> low profit. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No, I think it, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's so important and I think it's important to think big and not just, um, I, I do think that this idea of, of, there is abundance in the world and, and, and really it's, it's. It's our it's our duty to make sure that others have that as well. And I think, you know, along those lines, you mentioned, you know, there, there's a few different ways to phrase it. But, you know, making the world work for 100 percent of humanity um, and, and things like that. What do you 
what can you say to people that are like, you know, I'm too busy. I got my own problems, you know, whatever name, name your, I'm sure you've heard a million of them. Um, you know, what do you say to people like that? Cause uh, you know, I think, I think there's plenty of people that certainly they, they're, they have their own issues, but why is it so important that people think beyond themselves? Well, first of all, I think it's, it's too narcissistic to think only of yourself. The joke, if you'll forgive a joke, is the guy's hitting on this woman and says, talks to her two hours about himself at the end of which he said, enough, enough about me. What do you want to know about me? <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> right. that, that, that is narcissistic. And the danger with narcissism is that's not why you're here. Back to, I'll do a spiritual overlay because I'm writing a new biography on, on one of the great spiritual illuminaries of our time that died a short time ago. And his family came to me and said, Dr. Hansen, would you write this? And I go, I've not written biographies, but boy, I want to dig into this. And I studied Walter Isaacson and Ken Burns and all those guys that are the greats in it, which is what you got to do. If you're going to do something great, you better study the best in the world of it, whether it's art or music or whatever, all yeah. of whom we have in ratio. I'm thankful to say, and I, I want to talk to that in a second. But in answer to your question, every one of once you get over being a minimalist and a survivalist and get into thriving, your job is to say, how many can you serve? What the greatest amongst you is servant of all? How many of you, how many can you serve? And, and right now, the question we put in our ask book at the end, the biggest question is like Dr. Peter Demandis wrote the question, what are you, individual, everyone listening, positively going to do to influence a billion people in this decade? Well, that kind of question will keep you up late at night. <laughs> that is, right. Right, really. That's really a good question, and I've embraced it, endorsed it, and obviously I've had a billion readers of my books, but I personally want to sell a billion books. I want to, with all the media that we're doing like this, I, I hope it, it expands out to a billion people, not to serve me. I've already, look, my future days are paid for, but I want everybody to have their future days paid for so we can really get about important work. And in the subset of that, let me just hit on and answer your question. you got a guy like Elon Musk who set five goals when he was at Stanford. He came from South Africa. And, and right now he's putting up 40,000 satellites in the air. So we have an internet that is invincible, that's, you know, cyber yeah. warfare free. And, and when he got shut down by a governor that didn't have a good brain about what's happening and said, you can't build any more cars, he called up 3M and said, you guys can't make enough uh, ventilators for COVID. I've got 3D printing. I got manpower. I got metal sitting here. But he also happened to make 90,000 cars when he was supposed to be shut down and became the richest man in the world. That's what Horatio is about. And I don't know that anyone's nominated him, and I don't know him, but if I meet him, I will gladly nominate him because this is a guy that hears an obstacle and doesn't take it as an obstacle. He does what we're teaching in our Ask book. He asks, how can I get over, under, around, or through it? There is a solution. There is all, I hope I'm not shouting at you and the earth, <laughs> there's always a solution, and I'm on my soapbox. Because we are, we got to be, we, each of us have to be problem solvers. And I, one more line. And I, in my book, One Minute Millionaire series, I create, I wrote an entrepreneur finds a problem. And God knows there are more problems than ever before in human history because there's more of its life. Finds a problem, fixes it, scales it, and makes a vast profit, which is what everybody in Horatio has done. Whether it's David mm -hmm. Foster in music, he gives us the best music in the world, or Quincy Jones, or any of the big builders that we've got, which we've got plenty of, I can talk to a lot of them if you want it. I just, I love all my peers. Yeah, great. Well, yeah, Mark, um, I, I wish we could talk talk longer. I'm gonna have to have you back on the show, but thanks so much for joining. Um, for those listening, what's the what's the best way for them to keep up with what you're doing? Okay, three things. First of all, I'd love you to go to Amazon because that's the best place to get a book these days. Get a copy of Ask, The Bridge From Your Dreams, Your Destiny by Crystal and Mark Victor Hansen. And then we have a free book club because we want everyone to become master askers. It's called askthebookclub.com, askthebookclub.com. And then number three, just go to markvictorhansen.com and we got a bunch of free resources there that uh, and Hansen's S-E-N, the Danish way. I think you'd love to have them. I mean, I'm pretty good for a Danish kid that came out of a literate family uh, to be world's best-selling author. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> not bad, not bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks again, Mark. I really, really appreciate um, you joining the show. And um, again, you can learn more about uh, about him at uh, markvictorhanson, with an E, uh, dot com. Uh, thanks for listening to The Agile World with Greg Kilstrom. See you next week. Thanks again for listening to The Agile World podcast brought to you by Tech Systems. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom. 
If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can learn more and get a copy of my latest book, The Agile Workforce, from my website at theagile.world.